have my blue light sunglasses on right now because we are filming this late at night uh, here on the East Coast, but it is early in the morning in Singapore because we have a very special guest here today. So without further ado, Joseph, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks. It's uh, great to be here with you, Justin. I'm really excited, especially because as we were just chit-chatting before we started, uh, you know, this is a, a platform and a network specifically talking to strength coaches in our field. It's not it's not just a general uh, fitness chat or anything like that. And I think as guys like us have been around a little bit, we can uh, certainly try and shed a little more light on what we're doing as a company, but also what we're trying to do is hopefully senior guys in the field to help the field move forward. But yeah, I mean, basically that's my intro. I'm, um, I started out as a strength coach. I'm originally from Canada. I am sitting here now, as you said, uh, actually in beautiful Malaysia. I've been over in Asia for the last uh, 23 years and I've been training and working with athletes for about 35 years. I started way back in the mid eighties with uh, national programs in Canada. And yeah, I've seen, I've seen the field evolve globally. And, and now with the company, with Leela, I'm the CEO and founder of Leela Movement Technology. And of course we pioneered and are moving ahead with our primary product line, Exogen, uh, wearable resistance training uh, tools. And, you know, it's great to connect with you guys here and, and hopefully shed a little light on what the future looks like. So let's dive into the product briefly. And then, like you said, we talked off air about the importance of you know, changing how we think about everything. So I'm stoked to learn more about it uh, for our, you know, listeners out there. Jeff Moyer uh, had put us together because Jeff's been using it, had a lot of success. And again, I'm interested in it because you can be very intricate with the device. You can put it on different lint. There's, there's tons of ways that we can use it. So let's educate the masses on that. And then let's go into, you know, how we can think better as strength coaches. Awesome. Yeah. So back in just a, the little bit of the history and history is always a little bit important. Um, back in 2003, I was out here, I was training uh, sprinters for the Athens Olympics. We had a group of guys qualifying for Athens, you know, obviously world-class sprinters. And we were on the track pulling sleds and using a lot of the stuff that I call traditional resistance training, you know, external resistance. And it was, I just remember that day we're on there. I was there with the coach training with the athletes and we were going through the conundrum of, well, we're pulling this sled, we're pulling this weight. The entire session was about how the athlete was trying to adjust his body because the weight was causing him to do things he didn't want to do from a sprinting perspective. But of course the load was giving him some aspect of conditioning. And so there was this battle, you know, keep straight, don't do this, don't do that. And the athlete is just, you know, just, He's like, coach, what do you want me to do? Run fast or run tall or pull this weight? Now, they weren't saying that, but you can see that was what they were struggling with. And I remember watching this guy, and this guy was the Southeast Asian 100-meter champ. He was kind of the Carl Lewis out here then. He was the 100 champ, 200 champ, long jump champ, and sort of the four-by-one anchor. Very talented. And he looked the part, too. And as you know, uh, Justin, sprinters have a – all athletes have a look. You know, you could – you can pick an athlete walking by what sport they are if you've been in the field a while, right? Yep. And sprinters all walk on their toes. They strut. They look like they have arrogance, and they do, but that's also part of the, the feeling and the movement of speed. And I remember he was wearing tights and nothing else, had the body to do that. And I remember looking at him as he's walking back after running, pulling the sled, and I was thinking, if we could take the weight off that sled and somehow wrap it around those tights on the body while he's running – then we would, we'd have the weight without all the mechanical issues that the external load was applying. And so I, I literally went back that night, got online, and this is early internet, right? This is 20 years ago. And I was searching, I was searching for tools that could add resistance to the body. And all we really had was ankle weights, wrist weights, and weighted vests. And there was a couple other things out there that were sort of early day wearable resistance, but there wasn't any tools. So Next day, I went into the office there at National Sports Council. I was the head of high performance for the Olympic program. And oh, wow. I literally, I pulled out a, I pulled out a weight vest. I went in my office. I didn't want anyone to see. And I started cutting it up. <laughs> I took out, I took, you know, you know, back in the day when an office, all offices used to have that big paper cutter with the yeah, long yeah. blade hand. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if we, we still have those, but that was the only thing strong enough to slice the lead. So I was slicing the lead weights. I was making them into, I was breaking them into quarters, about a hundred grams, you know, a couple ounces each. 
then I was trying to figure out how do I glue that on and I started buying like wetsuit material and I started gluing it yeah it was just that those uh, Nick Nick Winkleman said it um you know Nick from uh, Exos and uh, a great guy and uh, you know a we somebody we've had a lot of strong connection with, and he really resonates with what we're doing with the product. But he said to me, he said, Joe, every strength coach or trainer in the world has tried to glue weight on the body. Now you've done it. Now it's going to take us 20 years to figure out how to use it. And, and I still love that story. And I always tell it because my story is no different than yours or anybody else's. Anybody listening who's been in the field a while has tried to make some way to add weight, a sandbag, a tape, you know, rope. Whatever it is, we've all been trying to strap load on the body because it's not that it replaces things like traditional resistance. It doesn't. But when we get movement specific, traditional resistance falls apart for two reasons. It's too heavy. The increments are too large. And most important, it's an external load rather than what we call an internal load. And this is a really important point. We needed, if we're going to fill out the force velocity curve, and, and this is a good place for to start because again, strength coaches are well-versed in things like the force velocity curve. If we look at that and we look at high force, low speed, that's, that's, your, that's your big bulk of traditional resistance, right? That's your heavy weights, dumbbells, kettlebells, whatever it might be. And as you move down that, we've moved into things like cables and toopings and weighted vests and ankle weights, you know, stuff that sort of fills out the middle range. But that far right range where almost all sport occurs there's almost no tools out there, you know? A 1080 is a good tool, but then it's very limited in its use for movement, right? It's, it's, a, it's a great linear tool. But how do you train at speed? How do you train movement? And so ultimately what I feel is we've created the best movement tool for high-speed training or sports-specific movement. And essentially what we have now is, I think for the first time in our 30, 40 year history of a strength coach is, we have a complete toolbox in the full realm from strength to speed. And so that's kind of the first thing I think I'd like people to understand is because I know when new, new tools come out, a lot of people, um, you know, a lot of people just, they become proponents of their own tool. This is the new thing. This is what you use. Like you've seen kettlebells come up mm. and now everything is a kettlebell exercise. And I'm like, well, it's just another resistance that you have to teach how to use. And the key difference is this. With traditional resistance, it's equipment-defined training. So the first, our first platform as strength coaches was to learn how to do strength training exercises. Then we learn that technique. Then we have to teach that to an athlete. And then the athlete can only get benefit from it once they've learned how to train with it. Whereas uh, wearable resistance or internal exercise, you don't have to teach the movement. You put it on them to accentuate the movement they already know. And that's the key thing. So it's you're working your skill of a start, your 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 mechanics in a baseball throw, a quarterback in a throw, uh, a defensive lineman on a roll, whatever it is, you already know the movement. So up here you have equipment to find movement. Down here on the far right of the curve, you've got user defined movement, and and it's a really critical critical sort of gap that defines the difference between those tools. And all we did was make a version that that you can put on the body. And for those, I don't know if this is a visual podcast or yep. if there's an audio, you know, yep. that's a load. That's that's a new load. That's 200 grams, that's eight ounces. And, and like Jeff and the guys know, when you put that on a moving body at high speed, it's doing a lot. And you know, and there's specifics on why that's shaped like that, that's actually related to muscle architecture. And the increments are also small. You know, we've got a 50 gram, 100 gram, a 200 or 300 gram, which is two, four, eight, 12 ounces. And one thing we found when I was actually creating the kit, I actually thought this is going to be too light because you know, what is a weight vest weight? Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. even anywhere between you could usually the lightest is eight or 10 and then it probably goes all the way up to 40 or whatever they want. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I started creating this kit and I remember movement had to be at the core of it, not loaded. And so I looked at it from the other end where we're always looking at how do we load more? I was thinking, no, no, how do we keep movement the core uh, um, uh, value that we're trying to put in this equipment? And as I went through, I just realized, man, the weight can't be heavy or else everything's going to fall apart. Like a weight vest, it's going to be bouncing. It's going to hit you in the head. Like an ankle weight or a wrist weight that with, with a distal loading, 
you, you know, you, the first thing you're going to be wired for is I don't want to throw my shoulder out. You know, your brain's doing that before you're even conscious of the movement. Yeah. And so, and because the body wires itself for safety first, no matter where you are in the world, no matter what you do, if you ever look at somebody like a special forces training, boxing or combat training, the first thing you're teaching a person is how not to essentially flinch because the body's first response is safety. Whereas in combat and a lot of all those other activities, you have to think about going forward when your body's saying don't. And so if you put a heavy load on the body, no matter what you want to do, if you're a baseball player and you put a 500 gram ball in your hand, and we know this debate is huge in the world of baseball, right? And you go to throw that. The moment you pick that up, the brain registers, what are you trying to do here? And I'm not going to let you throw this fast. And so you try to, but your wiring pattern has changed for protection. And then you spend, you know, half your career trying to get past that and maybe end up with that injury. And so one of the things I found out was I just can't get a lot of weight on the body. So I thought actually in the early prototype stages, it wasn't going to work until I started putting on high performance people. And I was having athletes saying, Joe, I don't want heavy weight. This is the right amount for me to sprint with. This is the right amount for me to jump over a high jump bar. This is the right amount for me to pole vault with. This is the right amount for me to swim with or for throwing or tennis or golf. This was the right amount for me to get what I need done at high speed and to accentuate those last percents of, of movement that they were really working on. And, and again, from a high performance perspective, you're working on one percenters, you're working on all those little details that change you and an opponent on game day. And so, and so those were kind of the really early findings and wonderings. That, but at the end of the day, for anyone listening, remember, it's still just weight training, but it's very lightweight training. And we're using it to accentuate movement. And I wrote down here before we started our whole job, you know, what's the job done of a strength coach? We should be focused on one conversation. How do we make better movers? How do we make better movers over time? So they move as well at the beginning of a competition, as well as they do at the end of that competition. You know, and that's, that's what the debate has to be about. That's what the conversation has to be about. That's what moves the field forward. And I think Exogen provides a tool to help that. And again, it doesn't replace things that provide high levels of muscle mass development, maximal and optimal strength. You're not going to get max strength with a four ounce weight. You know, if you're a, if you're a football lineman and you have to add weight in the off season, well, that's not going to do it for you. But if you're slow and you need to move and you're technically not hitting the patterns you do and your timing's off and everything related to the game needs work, then you're going to be using tools that you're in control of. So if any of our listeners are wondering like, okay, it's, you know, light enough, and not too heavy. You, again, when you said strength coaches, what, what would you say to him though? Like, all right, but is it strong enough? Like it, it was light enough, but is it still strong enough on the light enough scale? Like, how it how would you be able to answer them hearing all of that and again just being like yeah but how do you know that you couldn't have done like okay i heard the 300 gram like yeah i need a bunch of 300 gram on the athletes to be able to like, prove that they're you know that it's the right weight for them cuz like yeah, you said you know, remember we're dealing with strength coaches yep yep 100% so first thing i'll say on that is one of the reasons, you know, we've seen other products that have come out now and started to mimic it. The guys from Nike actually even created the kit, which has got it, but it's just a weighted shirt. There's a weighted pant. It's a set weight. And we know something in sport, you have to have progressive overload or else you can't adapt it to the body and training and movement. If you, it's the same old weight vest idea, right? Here's yeah. 10 pounds and it's not going to be, it's, and even if you can increase it by a kilo or a pound at a time, it's too much in movement. And so so one of the things we found was you needed to have increments again, but strength coaches know a lot about periodized loading. So one thing everybody in this audience already gets is how to progressively overload in the gym, right? So you got a guy who's doing bench press or squat. Okay, this week you put on, first day in the gym, you put on a couple of 40, pay, you know, you put on your 44 pound plates, had the bar, total there is like 130 plus for that. They did that for 10 reps. They did it well. You think, all right, next week I'm going to go up. Well, how much are you going to go up by? You're not going to go up by 100 pounds. You know, you're probably going to add on an extra 10 pound on each end. See how they handle that. We know the progressions in traditional resistance. The progressions in wearable resistance are light at high speed. 
are the exact same concept. They're just measured now in grams and ounces. That's why we made these increments and we discovered the increment loads are about two to four ounces progress. So if a guy's starting with 200 grams or say eight ounces on their calf slip and you're working on a speed drills, then you notice they're able to handle it. Yes, they're being challenged, not compromised. And they're working harder, your RP score is there, but they're keeping, most important, if you're with a sprinter and you're doing set of, say a set of five by 70s, most important is you have a timing goal for those 70s. Whatever it is, every sprint coach or speed coach, always time is what you're trying to achieve, right? With a certain level of movement quality. So there's no good me making a weight tool that just disrupts that. The weight tool had to fit that. So if you started with 200 grams and you see this week, yeah, he's good. He can handle that 200 grams load. He's keeping the patterns I want. The next week you'd go to 300 grams. Then you go to 400 grams and you would see them challenged the same way you would with something like a squat or a deadlift. So the load increments with light wearable resistance or microloading is generally in the range of 100 to 200 grams in the same way that in a gym setting, it would be five to 10 pounds. And, the, and what we know as strength coaches still applies because it's still weight. It's just a lot lighter than you thought. And this is why, because when we did this, uh, the analysis on movement, we can see that an athlete's sensitivity at high speed you give me an American baseball player, a quarterback, a sprinter, they will tell you the difference between 100, 200, 300, 400 grams in their movement pattern. And we've done this. A combat guy, a UFC fighter, and actually we validate a lot of this specifically with combat. When a punch is thrown, it comes from a very specific place, right? Power and speed is developed specifically. But when you go from four to eight ounces, the athlete will turn around and say, oh, now, now, now I'm not producing power the same as I was at, at four ounces. Now I'm starting to use my hip. Now I'm starting to throw the punch. Now I'm winding up rather than just propelling. And so we can already within that sort of four to eight ground, uh, ounce weight load, I'm using ounces just for our North American audience as well, but I guess most people now get grams. But we can see that athletes will notice this is now challenging me. No, this is too heavy. Now my mechanics are wrong. And when you spend all your time on movement skill specificity, why do we put a tool that sort of erases that or affects that negatively? And that's why we, uh, if you asked me three, four years ago, that question, we were still learning it. But now without a doubt, we've adopted the sort of light resistance micro loading progressions to the same model that we have with heavier traditional resistance, and we know those increments. And I'll give you, I'll give you two examples that kind of hit it home for people that would the uh, North American audience would know. Justin Gatlin, and of course the work that uh, Jeff did with Najee Harris. Now, Najee came to Jeff, I think, just a couple of, he, he came to Jeff just before the preseason, right? He came in the preseason with a very specific speed issue. And again, Anaji Harris doesn't walk up and say, hey, guys, I got to get stronger. You know, he did that when he was 15, 16, 17. Now he's looking for those. He's looking for I need that one percent of extra acceleration to hit my gap in my timing. In a game. And so he Jeff did uh, some analysis and he found his major issue was what his recovery leg and sprinting was doing. And it wasn't coming and closing at the angle that they wanted it to so that he could run freely, quickly, fastly. Very technical issue. So Jeff called me up, said, what can we do? We put together a program and in four weeks we corrected it. So much so that Najee ran off, he took his kit to the Steelers training camp and he wore it during all the drills for the Steelers camp. And the great thing for us, which was lucky, the Steelers had their video crew that day. The next thing all over the Steelers Instagram is that was Najee training with their X's and sleeves. And I think he had the calf sleeves and the shorts on smashing through drills with the kid on with his helmet but that resonated because it said he's seen the value in that tool but to tell you how much load Najee Harris what does he weigh 240 pounds what is he six foot two that's how much load he used 300 grams 300 grams was the load we used on his calf sleeves and his shorts and I think it might have even got as high as four so two of those to specifically target what his hamstring activation and his angle of recovery was during that cycle to improve that angle, to soften the movement and allow speed to occur. And so, 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 for, so for a strength coach listening, 
there's kind of always two questions they have. How much, how do I know how much load to use? How do I know where to put it? Because we know where to put weight on a bar, right? You slide it on the end. And then we created chains, right? So we we kind of we 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 understand that. But loading of the body gets a little tricky. And, and the, the first answer I'd have to that is just go online and look at some of our videos. It's a lot easier than you think. Now here's Najee Harris, uh, one of the world's best movers, right? Certainly one of the best movers in the NFL in his position. Within one or two sessions, he already knew where the load should go because he felt it. I helped guide Jeff in the loading position and the amount, but the moment the athlete put it on and, and wore it, he's like, I know exactly where I need that load because I can feel where it's working on my body. So does it work better on the front of the arm or the back of the arm? You have a nervous system. <laughs> You'll know it in two seconds. And then the other one was on the on the pure on the amount of not overloading was Justin Gatlin. So Justin Gatlin, arguably one of the best, you know, 100 meter specialists of all time. And when we signed our partnership with Star Athletics down there in Florida, with Dennis Mitchell, who's an excellent technical speed coach, um, we'll be down there, I think, again in the next couple of weeks. He put the product on Justin. Justin, of course, was one of the first guys he was going to test it with because Justin had so much experience, you're going to get valuable input from him, right? And, and that, and, and a lot of coaches want that. They don't want to put on a new guy who doesn't even, you know, know how to tell you what they're feeling, right? But a guy like Justin will, he's he's test, he's used everything. So they put it on the product, put on the shorts. And I had already had an intro session with Dennis online. And I said, start with 200 grams. When you see they can handle the load on the track for the movement then progress by another 100 to 200. Trust me on this, the moment they put it on, they're going to want more weight. So he told me this story after, and he said, Joe, man, you were 100% right. I put this on Justin. It's so comfortable. You know, it's compression-based clothing, as you've seen. The weight literally wraps and molds around the body. The first thing he said is, coach, I can't feel anything. This is light. But I told the coach, I said, but he hasn't started moving yet. Wait till he starts moving. So Justin's like, I want a little more weight, a little bit more weight, took a few more weights, slapped it on, you know, the classic mistake. Then he runs, he does a probably a 70, 90 meter run. Now at his speed, maybe 80, 90%, whatever it was. He walks right up to the coach and he goes, this is a lot heavier than you think. And, and immediately took that weight off because then that, in that one run with someone like Gatlin, he got, he understood it all. And a week later, he even took the kit with him to Tokyo when he had the pre-Olympic. He was in one of the athletes invited in to Tokyo for a pre-Olympic event. They were doing some promo for Tokyo. He ran the 100. He brought it with him for his warm-up kit. And so those stories are designed to help people understand that the athletes are choosing that lightweight. So the average load for an athlete, almost any size, is somewhere between two to 500 grams. And it might go up to maybe a kilo, like two to three pounds. But the other thing too, is it'll be dispersed, right? So someone throwing a punch might have it in through the shoulder, around the core and across like an ipsilateral pattern because of the rotation. And there'll be a little bit of weight dispersed, but very rarely will we load really heavy distally just because of the safety mechanism it wires in the body. And so our basic, the basic uh, line we use to help coaches understand how much load is too much, the athletes should be challenged, but not compromised. And like a, like, a, like a sled will compromise you. You know, you're going to battle it just because the load is heavy. And again, I'm not knocking sleds. They have a, they have a great role and they serve a purpose. But when you're, when you're working on specific skills and movements, the, the number one thing you want to keep is technique. So the athlete should be challenged. They'll come and oftentimes you'll, you'll work with a sprinter or a footballer and they'll do a drill and they'll come back and they say, coach, man, Remember how you're talking to me on that turn, the turnout of the leg? Wow, with that load there now, I have to really concentrate because the weight's making me work. So we get an attenuation of focus when the load is in a movement that we didn't have before. And certainly something like a bouncing, you know, weight vest or weighted shirt doesn't provide, because again, that's just load. So, so that kind of, that's sort of the demystification of what it does in movement. The two questions that are always tough are, how much load and where do I put it? I think our resources online right now are really good in that area. But the, the basic line I tell coaches is follow our progressions, 100, 200 grams a week, start light. 
keep movement quality, keep your focus on your speed, whatever that is for your time. If you notice, you know, and strength coaches know the 10% rule, right? If you're outside about five or 10% of your speed for that drill, that weight's probably a little too heavy. And so you want to keep that. And when we just say, if you notice the athlete's starting to get too slow in those 50s or 70s or 150s, take some of that load off. Maybe the first set you had a little too much load, but don't turn it into another tool that the athlete has to battle. And, and then the second one is where to put it. You know, and our whole education is around that concept about loading the problem. If someone's got a specific area, put the load where you see the problem. Start there, have them do the movement, and almost immediately and instinctually, the athlete themselves will get a feeling like, I think I need the load a little more to the outside. I think I need a little more towards the calf rather than the knee. And again, they have a nervous system. It gets really, really simple, really quick. And at the end of the day, strength coaches understand weight training, and this is just weight. When you mentioned, you know, put it where, where they need it. So with, like you said, somebody with a hamstring, do you put it directly on the hamstring or, you, like, you know, distally? So that way the hamstring has to work more difficult to, you know, continue to close that, the shank when yeah. coming through. That's a great question. And, and that's, to be honest, I, I, I wish we even staged that ahead because that's the perfect question, uh, uh, Justin. So there's two, there's two, uh, two thoughts on that. First off, as you know, you have to load the piece that's being moved. So if you're working the hamstring, well, the hamstring's lifting the lower shank, right? That's its job is to close the angle at the knee primarily. So ultimately you wanna put the load on the lower shank somewhere around the calf. Now you're directly going to stimulate the hamstring muscle. Now that's how we started learning. Then we started learning something else. These loads, when you put them on the body, the athlete feels, right? And this is proprioception. So every movement problem has two components, awareness and then improvement, right? So if, if you tell an athlete, I want you, you need to engage that hamstring more. The first thing they'll be thinking like, uh, okay, what does that mean? And so as a coach, what are you gonna do? You're gonna hold their calf. You're gonna say, push against my hand. I want you to feel your hamstring. Can you feel it? There, that's the muscle. You're gonna put your hand on the hamstring. You're gonna stimulate that. You're gonna cue them, right? You cue them. And then you're gonna tell them, you're gonna take that little cue <clears throat> that you've kind of inputted. Then you're gonna ask them to go into the drill. And now you're gonna ask them, remember that. And then they're gonna try and remember that. But you're also asking them to do 10 other things like run fast, make a cut, catch the ball, whatever it is. So what we found was you need to put the load on the athlete to stimulate the muscle, but you need to put some load directly over the muscle. Because when you put a small load directly on the hamstring, the athlete will walk away and you'll literally see them walking away going, oh yeah, I can feel that weight on my ham. Now they're aware of their hamstring. And so the problem is, which one do you use to help an athlete? Some athletes are such good movers and so in tune that just putting the load on the actual muscle working as a stimulus, almost like leaving your coach's hand on the muscle while they're actually moving and they will create the engagement themselves. They don't need to be stimulated below to make the hamstring actually work. Now that's a really rare case, but it does help already. You put the load on the hamstring, you have them run that drill, immediately you'll see them, already. they'll walk up to you and say, okay, I can feel the hamstring, I need to engage it. It's, it's not working like the, the other side. So then you ask yourself, all right, is it enough? Because if it's not, then you think, let's add that weight uh, below the, below, We'll leave the small one on the hamstring. And now we're gonna put a load on that lower shank and we're gonna hit it one, two. And so we call this kind of loading above and below the joint, right? And so if it was a shoulder and someone's trying to get a little more emphasis in a throw, you can put weight on the arm because now that's weighted and those muscles all have to work. But if you put load in and around the shoulder that stimulates what the joint needs, you, we tend to get a better movement. And so, you know, but it depends on the athlete. But there's those two ideas, load on the body part that's working for awareness, load the, the, the joint or the segment that needs to be lifted or moved, because ultimately that's going to create the strength adaptation, right? Just like you put a bar, you don't, you know, you, um, you take a look like a dumbbell or a bicep, right? I can put my hand here and say, I want you to contract more. And there's all these EMS suits that are out there now. That's the basic idea of EMS, right? I'll put a stim here to get a stronger contraction of the bicep. 
And yes, we see that can have an effect in some situation on strengthening the bicep. But ultimately we need the weight down here on the shank. So the bicep is overloaded. And we can do that directly with something like wearable resistance where there's load directly on the muscle and then there's load directly on the limb being lifted. And that hamstring is such a great case because probably 70% of team sport athletes come to us with issues. It's either at the hip or the knee, right? Something in those movement mechanics for running. Does that make sense? Oh, that makes perfect sense. And so when, you know, to kind of wrap it up before we talk about the other part of it, when, when people are getting it and they're doing their incremental loads, are you, you know, advising incremental load um, below or above, which is the kind of general recommendation from, from you guys? Yeah, always, always uh, at, for safety, always work from proximal to distal. So, uh, and that's, and that's that, that, and again, a strength coach understands that because they understand biomechanics. And so that's usually, you know, there's a lot of things I think listening, strength coaches have never even seen the tool right now. If they're versed in our field, like they should be and gone through a kinesiology degree, they'll be getting all that simple lever system. If you've got to say, you've got a baseball guy or a tennis player. The first thing you don't want to do is get that load down at the wrist. Cause that's the problem we've had with that weighted implements and, and weighted balls is it's going to wire uh, a safety response. So start proximally, start loading around the shoulder. The first thing they're going to say is, okay, that's not so bad, but the weight's there. It's, it, the movement's being forced. And the first increment we suggest is don't add more weight, move the weight down. So, oh, yeah. so, so your first week, and before you start adding more weight, start moving it down the limb. So we start most of our speed guys around the hips right? Get the loading on the hips, get the body aware, like get them used to the feeling of loading up, what it means to move the load around. And then the second progression is, all right, let's take that load and move it from the hip to the knee. And our research team, you know, one of the things you and I talked about before was we've got over 35 published in high impact sports science journals already on the science of exogen. And all of that's been done through with John Cronin out of AUT Springs with schools like Loughborough, the University of Texas, Altus, you know, we've been doing it with the best institutes around the world, UFCPI. And so we've learned sort of the mechanics of what happens when you, when you actually move these loads. And this is an interesting number. If you take half a kilo to a kilo loaded at the hip, okay, and you go for a sprint, and then we take that load and we just move it to the knee, that equals a 25% increase in rotational workload of that movement. Now ask yourself, that's incredible. That's a 20 centimeter move down the shank and you got a 25% increase in workload. Now for a strength coach, how much weight do you have to add to a bar to get a 25% increase in a squat? You know, that's, that, that could take six months to do. So this is again, what it taught us was start proximal and move distal because what we never knew was a small change in position has a massive change on rotational output and all movements rotational. And the other thing you have to think of with that little piece of data is imagine what we're doing in weighted ball throwing and weighted implement throwing our movement to the joints. So I just moved, I just talked about moving a load from the hip to the knee and a 25% increase in rotational workload. What do you, what, what, what's happening to that poor hip joint, you know? So we have to think about high-speed movement in a lot of areas. And if you follow our guidelines, and again, you know, we've been an injury solution for people, not an injury problem, you're going to have no issue. So yeah, start proximal, low distally, because a lightweight at high speed, it's doing a lot. Mm -hmm. All right, so shifting gears now to what you and I had talked about off air and we kind of teased you know, at the beginning, um, you know, kind of shifting the, the paradigm and shifting the, the mindset and the, and the thought process of, you know, strength and conditioning coaches, what, what were kind of some of those things that you wanted, you know, to, to be able to talk about with, with the people and the listeners? I've been waiting to have this conversation for 20 years, honestly. Uh, and I kind of, I'm a guy who sits back a little, works on things on my own, kind of just keeps looking for what's new. And I don't always take the chance to sort of go out and share it, but when I was thinking this morning on coming on here, I, I just kept thinking, you guys are the Strength Coaches Network. In our conversation earlier, this whole platform that you created was, was not just saying, we always did this, let's create a platform that's, a, and, and as you said, our job is to educate strength coaches, right? So the first thing I wanna throw at everybody is, 
I, I went on Twitter recently. I just got onto social media in the last two months. And I sat with my, my, my staff is making me do all these things now, right? And so I went on Twitter and I sat there for two months just reading tweets. And I'm like, I don't get it. I honestly don't get it. And of course, they 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 got all they got me all these strength coaches to follow and people with, you know, they've all got 10,000, 20, 30, 50, with something in that range. I think strength coaches kind of got maybe up to a hundred thousand. You got to do something special to get over a hundred thousand people. I don't know, you got to get caught smoking pot or you know, you gotta do you gotta get in trouble. But so I'm following all these guys and I'm just watching it all, and it's all about reps and sets and oh, don't do this and do that. And I'm thinking okay, I think there's a place for those conversations with young people coming into the field, learning some of the base tools, but is that really what the field is about? I remember one guy posted something three by eight or eight by three. And if you're doing three by eight, you don't know anything. And I was thinking, oh my God, is this the hot topic in, in our field? I wrote something this morning. I said, the only thing we should be focused on in our field is how do we make better movers over time? Because strength coaches, you may not agree with this, but after 35 years at every level of it, your job is to help win. You have to be performance minded. And I have had strength coaches and, you know, uh, Justin, I hope, you know, we're, we're aligned on this, or at least I, I'm open to your thought, but I've had strength coaches say, no, my job's in the gym to make them stronger. Whether they win or not, that's not up to me. When you've worked in a high performance team culture, like an Olympic program, and you've got a, the world champion, and you've got a whole support team around them, nobody on that team can have that mindset. You can't say, well, they're fit. I did my job, you know, because you did a vertical jump test and a beep test, and they had the right score for their category, but they went to the Olympics and they didn't qualify for the finals when that was the target. So you have to be performance minded, and performance is about movement, and it's about movement over time. That's all it is, right? Every sport has some amount of time component. So if you're a boxer, X amount of rounds. One thing you see if you're an MMA fan and I'm a, you know, I'm a boxer and a huge combat sport fan, how many times, they call it the championship rounds, right? How many times do you see a guy win in the championships round? The Diaz brothers, because they've weaponized the pace. So they're good movers for a very long time. A lot of people are really good movers at the start of a sport. So... If you're there, a strength coach, your number one job, in my opinion, is to help improve movement, make your athlete a better movement over time. That's kind of job one, which comes to the next point. Well, before I say anything else, what are your thoughts? <laughs> I don't. Oh, wanna... I mean, yeah, no, there's there's just so many bad myopic strength coaches that do exactly that. Like, oh well, you know, I did my job with my slab of meat and uh, got him stronger. Pontius Pilate, like that's one of the worst things I've ever heard is. You know, oh, I made my recommendations and then Pontius pilot and hide behind data like I have some yeah. choice words that I'm not going to use so that way I can keep, you know, the YouTube people on here happy with us. But like, I mean, it's just ridiculous, he, especially anybody that says the Pontius pilot part to, to try to play the biblical aspect, because it's like actually in the Bible, they say that Pontius Pilate was, you know, a coward. But and I'm, again, we're not going down that rabbit hole, but. <laughs> There are so many strength coaches that just don't want to actually be accountable to a true high performance metric of, you know, the wins and losses. Cause you're right. Like, I mean, even a sport coach can't control winning and losing, right? right? Like it, but at the end of the day, at least if you make that your goal, it forces collaboration with the sport coaches, with the athletic trainers, with the nutritionists, because mm you're at least putting your money where your mouth is, right? And like uh, somebody once said that to me, like, oh, do you really want, you know, the your success metric to be this when this, the sport coach can mess it up? And I said, yes, that's the point of our job is we have to be getting and working with sport coaches. So what better way than to have a metric where they have, like, they can mess it up. It's literally forcing us to have to work with them. Like, so that's my rant on my soapbox. <laughs> No, I mean, uh, when I got out, when I got out to National Sports Council Malaysia, that's why, you know, I left the NBA, I left pro sports, I left that program in North America specifically because I saw, like we talked about, you know, strength training in North America back in the uh, 19, late 90s was one way. And I just thought there's got to be more. And when I got the opportunity out there to come to Malaysia, I thought, well, I don't know what goes on out there. But too, when I looked at their program, I realized this is an Olympic program. All of a sudden, I had 1,500 national athletes in 40 right. different sports and disciplines. 
And, and I knew I was going to be challenged. But the other thing I saw was they brought coaches in from Russia, from China, from Australia, from England, from USA, from Germany, the whole world, right? They were a young country. They were out shopping for the best coaches, all these coaches at world championships. And that was back in the day when everybody was moving or started moving around the world and really getting opportunities abroad, right? And places like Australian Institute of Sport really did a good job on sort of defining the new high performance models. I got thrown into that world and I was like, geez, what am I going to do? And the first thing I realized, all those, I had to hire a whole staff. I think we hired 30 strength coaches. I had to hire them, train them, get them up to speed, put them into differentiated groups within those sports and then start managing that. And the first thing I saw was all they did was sit in the gym. So I made it mandatory. You had to visit your sport three times a week. You have to sit with your coach three times a week and you have to ask your coach questions about that sport. And I remember one of my uh, strength coaches, one of our strength coaches came back to me and said, Joe, <coughs> I went down to the training. And he said, you know what the, the coach said to me? <coughs> Excuse me. I think this was, uh, it was either Taekwondo or full contact karate. And they trained on the other side of the complex. The complex here is massive, right? I mean, it's a, it's a sports city. And, and he came back and he said, yeah, what'd the coach say? And the coach looked at him when he walked in the door and he said, oh, welcome to a, jo a dojo. This is where we train for sport. And the coach was cocky and, and kind of put him in his place, but at the same time was really excited to see that strength coach walk in and say, now I respect you enough to come to your world and to learn. And they started to have a different mindset. And then they started coming back to the gym and saying, I don't think this is gonna help because what I saw he needs isn't the strength program I put together. And so I agree, if you're, and I don't want to bang those guys who live in the gym or girls who live in the gym. I think there's some people who are really good at that. If that's what you like, if that's your forte, great. But if we're moving forward, you have to be connected to the outcome your sport and athlete needs in, high, in the competitive environment. And for me, that's the only conversation I'm interested in. I, and I would say that's, you know, how do you make them a better mover? And if you are new, Get out there and engulf and engage yourself in the sports that you're working with. Go down and watch that athlete. I promise you, one session of watching an athlete with a coach, asking the coach questions, it, I guarantee you will go back and you will rewrite your strength program. And you, you, you've seen that, right? I mean, even for me, I write a program, we do it. I go down next day, I think, geez, we got to change some of this stuff. Even oh, after, <laughs> yeah. Decades, you know, because now the issue is new or maybe that's not the way to work. So I, I know it sounds like such a simple thing. And I think there's a lot of good coaches out there that say, Joe, what, you know, Justin, I get that. I do that. But there are still a lot of them who don't. And, and I think that's sort of error number one is being disconnected, you know, and I think there's some really good programs that do that, some really good people that do do that. And I think if there's one thing you can do better to start is connect to the athlete in the sport. The best people in the world do it. You know, um, sorry. No, you don't need to apologize about that. I mean, I don't even think, I think that's a mic drop moment, right? Like you do have to, because yes, you're, you said you're not going to right? like, but you said you're not going to the dog on people that just stay in the weight room. But I mean, I will like, there's too many, I mean, you mentioned all this, but Stu McGill, these are his words, but too many strength coaches have a PhD in the weight room and a GED on the field, right? With movement. <laughs> And it's pathetic. Yeah. Um, so I, I do agree with you. Our job is to help make better movers and movement is messy and it's, it's difficult to figure out, but that is what our task is. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's a better place to, to kind of wrap it up for everybody um, and kind of tease it, right? Like that's the whole point of all this was to, to give everybody a little bit of taste of what, you know, what Leela brings to the table, um, you know, what the product is. Um, so for anybody, you know, that is now like, okay, Hey, what, where do I, where can I go? What's, you know, direct me to the website, direct me towards where they can follow you and more of the, uh, information on the product. Yeah. We've got a bunch of great information. You just go to Leela, Leela team.com. That's the website. I think that's a great place to start. I think Instagram is Leela athletes, just one word with two ways. Um, and, and jump in. And uh, I think there's contact information for me there. Most people know me. I'm open to talking to anybody that's interested in a good conversation. I talk to coaches and trainers almost every day around the world. I love getting in those conversations. Don't ask me about three by eight or eight by three. I'm going to tell you the truth is it doesn't matter. That's never won a Super Bowl. 
Um, but you he's going to say it's four by six or six by four. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, for me, make it easy. It's one by one, you know. Go in and lift one heavy lift once a day. Yeah, that might be enough. But yeah, you know, I think I, and even the concept of strength coach, I, this is a question I want to ask your audience because this is the other area. And I know we've got to move on from time. You're good. So if you're, if you're the strength coach, who's the flexibility coach? Oh. Who's, who's the agility coach? Who's the return to play coach? Who's the endurance coach and the conditioning coach? I even think if we call ourselves strength coaches, we're already in a way limiting this. And we talked about this earlier when we first connected. When I moved out here, I dropped strength coach and we call ourselves conditioning specialists because our, our goal is to condition the body. And that's, and, and it's sort of like the medical field. If you look at the metal field, you know, maybe the question is, do we need to go that route? Because when you study medicine, you're a GP, right? There's a base level of knowledge. So what's the base level of knowledge in strength and conditioning? Oof. And then what's the specialist knowledge? Are you a nephrologist? You know, are you an ENT? Are you orthopedics? And I, and I really think the medical model is a great way for us to start thinking. And I want to, I'd love to work specifically with you guys at the Strength Network because of your dedication to this conversation. How do we start using a model that's shown? The three major professions in the world, medical, engineering, law, they all have that breakdown. Engineers have a base level of knowledge and then you go chemical, you go civil, you go what, you know, whatever it might be, environmental. In law, you'll go in corporate, you'll go contract, you'll go litigation. So, Oof. you know, where, where do we go? And, and I really think, you know, one, we got to get better at movement specificity and creating movers. And two, we got to better on understanding how our field's going to grow as a profession. And I, you know, I'm excited to be part of that, I hope. Yeah, me too. And I, that's actually a great, that's a great mental stimulus for me and everybody else too. Like, because that's a great point. There, there are strength coaches out there, strength conditioning, high performance, whatever, you, like you said, but they do have their expertise. And, you know, maybe if you can start to continue to, okay, hey, they're going to just work on and be able to come up with, you know, that, that model. That's something that I'm interested in too. And, you know, this is the teaser. This could be a conversation that we have, you know, in uh, four or five months down the road, once uh, more of our listeners have, you know, purchased and used the, the device. So I thank you very much for your time today, brother, and uh, have a great rest of your morning. Congratulations on making it to the end of the video. Why don't you celebrate by watching more videos just like it? You can also help us on our quest to placate the algorithm gods by liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting. Thank you.